It's June 25th, 2020. This is Rook. The story of being a member of a diaspora often includes navigating some kind of cultural duality or hyphenated identity. And so on this program, we've dealt with the complexities of, say, French Iranians or half American, half Persian people or Iranian Canadians or Swedish Persians, etc., etc. But what about an Iranian girl who grows up in Tehran and then is relocated to Israel? only to have to change her name, join the Israeli army, then find her politics and voice and become an activist, writer, and the first translator of contemporary Iranian literature into Hebrew. Orly Mujgan Noy joins me from Jerusalem on this episode. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Welcome to episode number 21 of Rook. Hope you are all okay out there, continuing to stay safe and sane. Omidvar hastam ke zendegitun okay bashe. Chitori ki anjun. Halam khube, hala shuma khube. Halat khube? Bale. Ye kami mesenke, you're a bit tired today. I am exhausted, yeah. Mm. I need to stop reading the news right before bed. It just gives me a lot of anxiety and I can't sleep. So, so your hall is khub, but you're uh, psychologically not as Psychologically khub. not as okay. Not as khub. <laughs> Captain Reza? I'm great. I'm fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Gubi Shaya? Thank you, I'm fine. Nice to see you. How are you? Uh, I'm okay. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Orly Noy. Um, but let me just also say, there's a lot of identity-based talk in the news these days, especially when it um, when it comes to cultural appropriation or the voices of folks. You know, there are people apologizing for voicing black characters if they were a white actress, say. And uh, I really appreciate all the awareness. But I do also want to say, where was all this awareness when they were casting the film version of Prince of Persia? Because I, ah. <laughs> I remember saying on the air at the time, actually, I'm available to play the Prince of Persia. Don't have the chiseled looks of Jake Gyllenhaal <laughs> or the Pex or, I mean, he's an amazing actor, but, you know, I have a more realistic nose and skin color. <laughs> and don't sell and, yourself short. You look great. You're, you're a great looking fella, Gian. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I you're thought you said also you're so short. No, no, no. no. Like, <laughs> I said, don't sell I'm not that short. I, I'm not short, actually. No, you're not short at all. Okay. No. All right. Well, anyway, uh, I mean, and then I was th- looking at the film again. And, you know, the other characters in that film, by the way, are not really Persian, like Ben Kingsley, uh, God love him, who's played a few Persians, <laughs> it seems like, in a few films. Amazing actor. But but anyway, I mean, all joking aside, like like they couldn't find one guy with some Persian lineage to play the, the Prince of Persia. That's very true. Who would you have rather replaced him? Um some Besides yourself, Asghari of on, Britney Spears' Ooh. boyfriend, right? <laughs> he could be Asghari. <laughs> uh, Asghari, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't even know his name. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. Andre Agassi? Maybe somebody That's with the thing. some. There's not many well known Iranian actors, I feel, in Hollywood at least. Well, they're I not given a chance. Yeah, well, that's what Give I'm saying. They Reza. Reza could have played. That's Reza. Right. He's a I could have been guy. Prince of Persia. Yeah. Come on, he's oh an my actor. God. He's I know, I'm just one of the yeah, stars of so. Rev. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right? Yeah, What's, available on iTunes. Isn't that a vodka demand. drink? <laughs> <laughs> What's Rev? <laughs> What's Rev? It's a it's a uh, feature action <laughs> film oh, that uh, that Reza worked on. No, he's in it. Oh, he's in he's it. He's one of the stars oh of it. Oh, my God. Shame it. on I me. I produced it. I wrote wow. it. You see, when you're a Persian talent, even the other Persians don't know you. That's, that's, that's the... So Keon's yeah. like, like there is not a lot Did he work? <laughs> was he a gaffer on the film? <laughs> Did he carry some coffee? I didn't know. You Reza work with him. Yeah. I, well, he doesn't talk <laughs> about that. He doesn't talk about that. He's a modest He's so guy. humble. Yeah. But he could have been the Prince of Persia. Oh. Prince you're, of Persia too. Let's you're work our on that. own. You're our own little Prince of Persia. Oh, Gian. Even if you are short. Uh, you're <laughs> Is he short? No, he's not short. Oh. None of us are short. But you know, 
Uh, anyway, maybe we can we can deal with this in a more profound way in an upcoming episode. I, I, I mean, uh, if you want to talk about representation, we, we, we don't even cast get cast as ourselves. <laughs> so yeah, uh, only when a terrorist is needed sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> Plenty of roles for that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's get to our guest, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. All right, Keon, you will be back with Letters of the Week yes. with Keon. Get excited. Captain Reza, see you in a few moments. See you guys soon. And uh, Groovy Shia. Shia. Groovy Shia. <laughs> you, well, I need you to stay here to get Orly yeah. on the line. Uh, we are certainly living in a a culture moment where issues of race, identity, and discrimination are at the forefront, as we've been saying, forefront of a global conversation. And we know that in the United States, there is a reckoning around overt and systemic racism towards black and brown people that will hopefully lead to some changes. But then issues of discrimination are also, of course, a global phenomena and not entirely new to, say, Jewish peoples or Iranians. Many migrants experience the pain of prejudice firsthand. So what about an Iranian Jewish person who ends up moving to Israel at a young age in 1979? My guest today has not only stood up to prejudice, her tumultuous life journey could serve as an anti-venom to all poisonous stereotypes. When she was nine years old, Mojgan Noy immigrated to Israel from Iran during the turbulent years of the Islamic Revolution. She soon changed her name to Orly to blend in better with her new home nation back in the 1980s. And since then, Orly has been a social activist, a radio host, a political opinion writer, a human rights campaigner, and is now an editor at Local Call. She has previously been active with the Coalition of Women for Peace and the Mizrahi Democratic Democratic Rainbow. And perhaps most notably for those of us in the Iranian diaspora, Orly is a translator who was the first person to translate great works of contemporary Farsi literature, including Daijan Napoleon, my uncle Napoleon, into Hebrew. Right now, Orly Noy joins me from Jerusalem today. Hello, Orly. Hi, very nice to be here with you. Very nice to have you on this program. First of all, how how has it been dealing with a pandemic in Israel for you? How are, how are you guys doing over there? Um, well, I think that uh, we passed the first wave quite successfully, and now we are very anxiously waiting for the second wave to hit. So I hope we will get through that one, uh, uh, you know, okay as well. <laughs> Right. It really is a, uh, speaking of global phenomenon, it, it, it really is something when you can say that and everybody listening around the world knows exactly what place you're in, because <laughs> we're, we're pretty much experiencing the same thing in Canada. Uh, you, you have such a fascinating story and connection with Iran and its literature. I want to get to that and your current activism. But first of all, take us back. You, so you were only nine years old when you left Iran, but you've said you knew, despite having had a good life there, things were changing and you needed to leave. This was during the revolution of 1979, of course. What do you remember about that time? You know, as a child, when your world is turning upside down, you look at it um, quite helplessly and you don't really understand. I remember the huge demonstrations. I remember uh, school shutting down and then just the waves of of demonstrations. Uh, I remember that my brother had just been accepted to Albors, which is a very prestigious high school uh, nearby the Tehran University. And uh, for some time, every day he went to school, uh, my father had to rush and fetch him because there were shootings uh, and um, you know, turmoil going on with the demonstrations that started from the university. One of the, I think, most um, memorable moments was uh, my father was the manager of a, a bank branch not so far from our house. Mm-hmm. And one very cold evening in January, we just went for a walk and we were standing across the street from his bank branch. And we just saw a bunch of people breaking in and um, setting the place on fire. And I think that was the moment that my my father said, okay, that is not going to, I mean, this country is not safe for us anymore. 
And I think that that was the moment that my parents decided to immigrate. How much, how open were they with you? When I think of someone like you, who's been so active and, and who is so connected to issues and what's happening in the world, I think you must have had parents who were like that. Were they, were they, were they telling you exactly what was going on at that time or were they somehow trying to protect you? They were not politically active in any way, as minorities tend to be. I mean, as part of the Jewish minority community, I think that my parents were very timid or, 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 or cautious about, you know, being political or critical in any way. Right. And I think that they really weren't cr- that critical. I think that they very much... Uh, supported the Shah's uh, regime, and the minute that they understood that it's not going to be the same country anymore, they decided to leave. At at the time, by the way, I don't think that they even thought about uh, a permanent immigration. I think that what they had in mind at the time was just to uh, bring my brother and myself to a safe place, and then when things calm down in Iran, maybe even go back. Right. Uh, and they actually went back to Iran for a couple of months after the Shah had left. And, um, and I, you know, the first few months immediately after the revolution, Iran was the liberal uh, <clears throat> paradise that the revolution promised it to be. So, so at that time, they even had some thoughts to bring us back there. But, of course, you know, things turned out very differently, and we... And we stayed. You've talked about missing a sense of belonging as a kid when you when you moved by no longer being in Iran. What did it mean to lose that sense of of belonging? Uh, it it has so many expressions to it. The first thing I lost was my name. Uh, you know, being uh, Israel, being a uh, country of uh, many you know immigrants from many many different places for many years it had a very strict policy of melting pot which means to blend in all the different immigrants from the different places in the world and create a new Israeli, a new Sabra which of course was supposed to be bright skinned and and blue eyed and and, and Ashkenazi, European basically And I wasn't that. So the first time I, the first thing I lost was my name. I didn't choose to uh, voluntarily to to change my uh, beautiful Persian name. <laughs> I, I remember it very clearly. I was a nine-year-old kid sitting in a classroom, barely speaking the language, and my teacher just said, "Well, now you're in Israel. You're an Israeli. You cannot go by your Persian name anymore. You need to choose right now a Hebrew name." And at the time, I only knew three. Two of the names belonged to my cousins, so I <laughs> felt badly about stealing well, right. their names. So I just kind of mumbled, "Okay, let it be Oli," and uh, and that's how I became Oli. Wow! Uh, so so you was, you decided at nine, and then you went home and told I your parents that. It. My name is Orly. <laughs> My parents weren't even in Israel. That was the time that they went back to Iran. We were in a boarding school. So when they came back a few months later, they found their two children with new names wow. and new identities. Wow. Um, so, so, you know, you grow, you're, when you're growing up not feeling attached or or not recognizing true, your true identity even in the most intimate thing which is your name it reflects on your entire experience of living of course. I think. does your mother call you mojgan still or orly no i'm uh, at home i'm mojgan of course with my persian family i'm mojgan hmm. but my husband calls me orly and um, everybody else basically who knows me in israel for he them doesn't, i'm orly he doesn't use one name uh, when he disagrees with you and another name when he likes you or, or vice versa <laughs> <laughs> um your 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 parents are are for, were from is- Esfahan. Uh, how was it for yeah, them originally there yeah how, how was it for them adapting to israel I think that my parents adopted retroactively a very 
uh, heated Zionist approach. I mean, they, they so, so after we came to Israel, they adopted the sort of narrative that said, oh, we've always been great Zionists and we always had the plans to immigrate to Israel, which of course would, would never have happened, you know, had it not been for the revolution. So, and they felt very grateful for the new co- country that opened its gates to us, and so their life mission became to express their gratitude to Israel by becoming, you know, good Zionists, and uh, which of course meant very, very heated uh, dinners later on when I became <laughs> a right. radical political activist. Right, right. Uh, but I don't. I think that you know, my father passed away three years ago. I think that there was not a single day that he did not wake up missing Iran with every bone in his body. I'm sure of that. But he didn't speak about it that much because it felt like being ungrateful, you know, to express the longings for the old homeland. You know, Orly, I'm going through uh, many, many interviews you've done over the years uh, uh, when you've been the interviewee. I found one from a few years ago where you talk about growing up in Iran and you talk about it being a very heterogeneous society, a mix of ethnicities and people. And and that might come as a surprise to folks, uh, many who now have a, this contemporary impression of Iran as quite monolithic in terms of its culture, in terms of its ethnicity, mm-hmm. in, terms of, in terms of its people. Do you find people are surprised when you call the Iran of your youth a real brotherhood between Muslims and Jews, for example? Definitely. I mean, the uh, level of ignorance in Israel, and I think generally in the West, when it comes to anything that has to do with Iran, is just unbelievable. I mean, first off, people in Israel are surprised that Iranians aren't Arabs. Then they are surprised that they are not Sunnis, they are Shiites. Then they are surprised that it was, and it still is actually, an incredibly mixed and uh, heterogeneous society, not only Jews and Muslims. In my immediate neighborhood, we had Asuris, Armenians, uh, Muslims, of course, Zoroastrians, Jews, and it was very normal for, you know, to coexist. Where was uh, that? Was that Isfahan or Tehran? Where? No, that's in Tehran. Tehran I was yeah. born and I grew up in Tehran. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, I was just curious about what the neighborhood was, where where you were. That was, I mean, we went to a Jewish school, but even I remember very clearly uh, one of the most excellent students in the Torah lessons was actually a Muslim kid. So even by going to a Jewish school, it wasn't about segregation or or separating yourself from the surrounding. It was extremely really heterogeneous and by that I actually became much more aware of my own identity and a very deep sense of being Jewish but being Jewish among many other uh, religions and, and cultures which was wonderful we used to celebrate each other's holidays I remember when I used to go to non-Jewish friends during Passover, for example, they knew not to serve bread at lunch, you know. So it was very tolerant and um, wonderfully heterogeneous society. You know, sometimes I have these conversations like this in these interviews, and I realize that I've bought into some myths or uh, misguided ideas or stereotypes of my own, one of them being that I just assumed people in Israel would be less ignorant about Iranians than, say, in England where I grew up or in Canada where people would always mistake us and still do for Arabs, for example. I just would assume because of the proximity, Israelis would know that we're not Semites, we're not Arabs, etc. That's not the case? Unfortunately, that's very far from being the case, and it's a mixture of both arrogance and um, and fear. I mean, Iran has been portrayed as this black, uh, monolithic, frightening source of terrorism with nothing to offer except fanaticism and terrorism to the world. And 
if you take into account that Israel was actually established, I mean, the Zionist m- movement was created by Ashkenazi European Jews with very clear colonial, you know, European colonial aspects to it. So the despise to the native or to the non-European was sort of built in, and it wasn't just towards the Iranian, uh, the, the Jews from Iranian origin. It's towards the entire Jewish community from uh, Arab countries as well, especially North Africa, Moroccans. Uh, etc. Can you imagine, I was being, you, you mentioned that I was the first one to translate Farsi, contemporary Farsi literature into Hebrew. Can you imagine the Israeli society just ignoring for decades this amazing cultural world because they never bothered to, you know, take a serious look at it or to, or to show the slightest interest in it? Unfortunately, um, I can't imagine that because it's not just uh, <laughs> it's it's not just Israelis I- I- ignoring that. It's people around the world, and and I I would dare say we do. You know, the Iranians are, are guilty of the same. Even that intra society, intra ethnicity uh, discrimination that you were talking about between, between Sephardic Jews or Persian Jews and Ashkenazi and stuff, we have that in the Iranian community in different ways as well. Um, and so I can imagine course. it. I can, unfortunately. Um, but you know, <laughs> if I get into your story, because I want to come to the uh, the, the translating part and get to more of these questions around the Israeli-Iranian divide. But uh, first, just to, to place you in people's minds who don't know of you yet, I, it, one, one part of your story that's quite interesting is that from a young age in Israel, you begin to make it a priority to work to help those who are having a tough time, whether it's mentally challenged people or the elderly. What made you gravitate towards wanting to help out others in need? I think that was, you know, my mother would say that uh, I started uh, my uh, teenage uh, rebels at a very young age and never stopped, basically, <laughs> until today when <laughs> I'm 50 years old. But I think there is a different level. I think that when, if the first generation, you know, being my parents, were so keen to to really integrate and become good Zionists, good Israelis, never criticizing anything. I think that my ability to to be critical in my work is actually an expression of their success. I mean, I they they were successful to uh, to the extent that I feel secure enough about my Israeli identity that I can actually allow myself to to criticize ah, it. Ah, interesting. But then the component of wanting to help out others in need, where does that come from? This is, I mean, I, I attribute that to my, the way I was brought up. I mean, it was very, very clear. It's a given, you know, that you cannot sit at ease in your home when you see suffering or need around you. Uh, And that just by being there, you have a responsibility to do something about it. Mm. For, For me, by the way, that's perhaps the most basic Jewish value. And, um, I think that there was something about the sense of, uh, the inner communal solidarity inside the the Jewish community in Iran that injected those values into us, that you look out for each other. And and then, you know, it's just a question of how you define your community and who who is it that you're you're responsible uh, for solidarity with. Well, whether you're the uh, perpetual, the, the unrepentant rebel teenager uh, for, for five decades <laughs> or not, you did join the Israeli army, which I assume wasn't a choice. It was what, what one has to do in Israel as you come out of your teens. What was it like to be in the Israeli army as a Persian girl? <laughs> I actually, I mean, it wasn't that I, ha- I didn't have a choice, but at the time I didn't think I had a choice. Because, for example, both my daughters refused to join the army because of political reasons. So, but at the time, um, it, it is mandatory in Israel, and I never thought of, you know, uh, uh, doubting that. On the contrary, I mean, I, I didn't have my political awareness at 18, 
and um, I was very, very proud to join the army. And then I, um, because of different qualifications, uh, including my knowledge of the uh, Farsi language, I uh, actually had a very interesting job, uh, unlike many, many other girls. I actually had a very interesting job in the army. Today, of course, I'm, I, I, I do regret doing that because I don't think that it's a moral choice. Uh, to join the army and that you need to refuse and pay the price but I was in a very very different place when I was like 18 and you know an immigrant that still needed to prove her Israeli identity and her belonging here so what did you do uh, were you a spy <laughs> well, I mean really <laughs> I'm very curious it's a cliffhanger you you have knowledge of Farsi well, and you're so <laughs> You're underestimating the Israeli security services, I think, <laughs> I because if I tell you that, then uh, <laughs> right, the, right, the right, right. length of your program will not, you know, it won't last for us. <laughs> right. For okay. Really well, I was being, but, I was I, being I, a little you know, uh, silly, but but I but I, I am I, curious what they what position you 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 took then in the Israeli army, or you were I, put I in. was in the intelligence, of course, and uh, I I put to use my knowledge of uh, the Farsi language, let's put it that way. Okay, okay. Um, uh, I, <laughs> okay. Well, well, you know, right around that time, too, you talk about, this is a, a really interesting turn of phrase you use, and I, and I just want to excavate it a bit more before I ask you about the rest of your life. You say, you talk about being a temporary migrant living inside a perpetual immigrant. <laughs> what does it mean? Uh, well, I actually wrote that when we were, my husband and daughters, uh, we actually uh, lived a few years in the United States. And I wrote that while being there. And I, all of a sudden, I thought, you know, I, I'm just constantly immigrating from place to place. And that wasn't, we knew that that wasn't supposed to be a permanent thing, but uh, we didn't know how long it was going to last. So I, but it's not just a title, being an immigrant or migrant. It's uh, it's a way of life, or a, a, it really determines so much for me, at least, the way I understand myself, I experience myself. It's it's perhaps one of the deepest levels of my identity, being an immigrant. At one of your uh, career stops along your journey, Orly. You you take a job at All Peace Radio, hosting a daily radio yeah. show. This is a bilingual station that was aimed at serving both Israelis and Palestinians, which sounds fascinating. I mean, it seems like a great idea. It seems also utopian. How did it work out? Yeah, we, from the get-go, uh, we had to face uh, numerous obstacles by practically everybody. I mean, we had to get the permission to broadcast and the frequency from the Israeli Ministry of Communication, and they gave us hell. And then we didn't have that much cooperation from the Palestinian side as well. And it was just very difficult also to cross through both audiences, both the Israeli and the Palestinian, but it was a very, I think, courageous attempt to actually create a space which speaks in both Hebrew and Arabic. We actually had programs that both languages were used during the same program, and we were simultaneously translating each other. Mm. and. Uh, it was experimental and it was brave, and uh, I studied so much from uh, that experience. But, you know, people listen to what they want to hear, and they didn't want to hear <laughs> our content, I mean, uh, criticizing and, and bringing the bare reality in the occupied territories uh, in Hebrew. Israelis don't really like to hear about that or to know about that. But the radio, by the way, is still operating, but only online. And what about um, the Palestinians? It's not on the air anymore. How, did they, how did the Palestinians, what was their, what they were also resistant, you're suggesting, to hearing 
about uh, hearing content in Hebrew or hearing about uh, how Israelis are living, non non Palestinians are living in Israel. By the way, no, I think that the Palestinian audience was much more attentive or uh, accepting uh, of the idea. But then the, the Palestinian society is very much divided along partisan lines. And, you know, each has its own broadcasting and uh, media outlets. So it's difficult to cross through that audience for different reasons. But they were for sure more cooperative and more at ease with the idea than the Israeli public, for sure. Uh, Orly, just as a sidebar, because I, I I want to get to the focus of, of the, the, the translations of Farsi literature in Hebrew in Israel, which is such a fascinating story. Uh, and and I we we could not do it justice without doing the entire episode about the Palestinian-Israeli divide and, and talking about that. So I, I realize you can't do this all in one question, but, but as someone, when I think about people like you who threw out in different ways throughout the last few decades, you've tried to work to bring Palestinian Palestinians and Israelis, Jewish Israelis together, um, you you obviously will run up against people who say, look, this is intractable. Uh, you're a fool to think that you can even try and uh, play a role in, in solving this somehow. Uh, wh- what is your response when somebody says that? Well, I've been called much worse than that, than being naive. I was called a traitor. Uh, you know, when you're an Israeli Jewish uh, citizen and you declare yourself to be not Zionist, you, you are called worse things than being naive. But then my answer is, so what do we leave to our children? I mean, is, is being uh, superior, is this sense of Jewish supremacy really more important than our children living in an equal, true democracy with equal rights with the Palestinian kids? Is that, I mean, do we really inherit the, the, the war eternally? I mean, is this a force of nature? Do we, are we doomed to fight and kill forever? You know, countries fought in history. Country, countries fought against each other for centuries, and then they stopped, <laughs> and then they had treaties, and they had peace, and they moved on to live as neighbors, maybe not always best of neighbors, mm-hmm. but at least they released their next generations from the need to constantly be on war. I don't think that we are doing that for our children, and I think that's a crime against them. I'm going to come back to, to your activism uh, before the, at the end of this interview, but let me let me get to how you end up becoming the foremost translator of Iranian literature in Israel. And I want to start it this way. Uh, what did you see when you first Googled Farsi literature in Hebrew <laughs> <laughs> in Hebrew a number of years ago? remember even why I was uh, why I was googling the word Farsi literature in Hebrew but Google's re- response was did you mean Russian <laughs> literature <laughs> and Russian and Farsi in Hebrew sounds sort of the same Usit the Palsit it's it's sort of similar but then I was so shocked because you know it's, Google doesn't have a sense of humor. He wasn't kidding. <laughs> right. Hebrew Google really didn't understand, didn't know, wasn't familiar with the right. term. You stumped uh, Google. It's, imp- it's, it's, <laughs> so it's impossible I, to stump I mean, Google. My yeah, yeah. Iranian uh, pride was devastated. <laughs> and I thought you know, something must be done. So, I mean, the the obvious question being that there there has always been a Persian Jewish community in Israel. So how was it that there had never been Farsi works translated into Hebrew? Because this wasn't that long ago, right? You're talking about a decade ago that you that you first uh, started r- realizing that there there isn't these works. Yeah. In, yeah. yeah th- the Farsi literature that uh, uh, has been translated into Hebrew before I started my contemporary translations was, you know, the poetry of uh, Hafez, Sadi, Rumi, the classical uh, poetry. 
But, you know, if you take into consideration that, let alone Farsi, which is not such a huge, com- you know, uh, community in Israel, we barely have translations from Arabic. And now, it's not only the Jewish community, the Mizrahi community from, uh, originally from uh, Arabic-speaking countries, we have t- 20% of Israeli citizens that their first language is Arabic, and we barely have translations from Arabic as well, not to mention the fact that we are surrounded by Arabic-speaking countries. And it's, uh, again, I think that the answer is both political and cultural. It's the culture of uh, uh, condescending and arrogance, and it's the politics of uh, hatred and resentment and suspicion. So I think it's it's for the same reason that uh, there weren't any contemporary Farsi literature translated the, into Hebrew. The, the politics of suspicion and hatred suggests that there was it was actively a decision to not translate this stuff, or it just wasn't considered important to do so. You mentioned that I was part of uh, the Mizrahi Democratic Rainbow. One yes. of the things that we did several years back is take the. Israeli budget, the budget of the culture ministry, and just analyze it and see how much of that money, uh, public money, yes, is going to uh, European culture, Ashkenazi culture in Israel, and how much to Mizrahi and how much to Arabic culture. Less than 2% of the public funding goes to non-Ashkenazi, non-European cultural projects in Israel. So, so, just, so, so to be clear to people listening, uh, to be clear, uh, clear to people listening, you, you're still talking about Jews. Mizrahis are uh, Jewish people of Middle Eastern background, yeah, right? Like, like exactly. you would be. Yes, okay. So, yeah, so for example, if you take two theater groups in Israel, one, uh, the Yiddish theater group, and the other is the Jewish Moroccan theater group, the Yiddish group actually receives public funds, and the Moroccan group group doesn't. So there was a very, and and, you know, if if you go back to the protocols of the Israeli government in the early 50s, just before the Jewish communities from the Arab countries were brought into Israel, it is, things are very, very explicit. I mean, they are saying very explicitly, we should be aware, these are the words of Abba Evan, who was uh, a prominent minister in the Israeli government at the early 50s, and he's saying very clearly, we should be very aware not to allow these savages to deteriorate us into their cultural level. So from the beginning, the Ashkenazi establishment looked at the Mizrahi Jewish communities as barbarians, as savages, as communities with no culture that need to be civilized into the Western uh, world. When this is the approach of the establishment, of course, you start believing that you really came from nowhere, that you really don't have a cultural background. And I think that that was my advantage as a first generation immigrant, that I knew where I came from. I mean, by, by the age of nine, my Persian sense of uh, superiority or identity was such that they couldn't convince me that I came from nowhere. They couldn't convince me that I had no culture. And so I did it. But for those who were already born into that mindset, the second and third Mizrahi generations, it was a complete tragedy. I mean, they, they, they really crushed the communal cultural backbone of these communities, for sure. You end up translating My Uncle Napoleon, Daijin Napoleon, into Hebrew. Mm. It's a very important book yes. to you and, and, and an important book to many Iranians. Tell me about your relationship with that book. You know, the copy of the book which I used while translating was the copy that my mother, uh, can you imagine, in, in the middle of all that chaos, And we really decided to, I mean, it took less than a couple of weeks for us to organize our immigration into Israel. And we left almost everything there. But my mother made sure to put into her bag a copy of Dijan Napoleon. And that was the copy Mm -hmm. that I 
I thought, well, if I... Because, you know, when I decided I want to translate something, then there were many questions. Do I want a contemporary text or a classical one? Do I want poetry or prose? Do I want, you know, political or not, or fiction? I mean, many, many questions. But then I saw that copy of Daijan, and I said, well, of course, that should be Daijan of Alone, because it has everything, and it's brilliant, and it's funny. And it's critical, and it uh, holds the essence of the Iranian identity in so many ways for me. Uh, of course, we were addicted to the TV series as well. So <laughs> I basically knew every line of, of that book by heart when, when I was translating it. You know, you know, translating things would seem to be a, a relatively benign act on the face of it. You've talked about being the, how being the first translator of, of this contemporary Farsi literature into Hebrew also feels like a political decision. How, how does it feel like a political decision? I think it's a very poli- it's a cultural activism, it's a cultural political activism. You know, when you think about the cultural er- erasing that I was talking about earlier, then the mere decision to give presence to your original culture becomes a political statement just by doing so. But then for me it was, I mean, my, my political approach to, to the act of translation was also expressed in the translating work, work itself. For example, it was very important for me that the reader will not get a sense as if the book were written originally in Hebrew. I wanted him to smell the Farsi language, to taste it, to have a sense of the original uh, language, which is, I think, the sweetest language in the world. So I used a lot of footnotes. I mean, many, many terms I just kept in the original form, and then I um, explained in a footnote even if starting from Daijan Apollon and every single book that I chose after had always some sort of a political angle to them. If it's a social criticism like Daijan Apollon or political criticism like uh, Zavala Colonel by Dolat Abadi right, the colonel, right. uh, or an, a great novel by a young gay Iranian brilliant, brilliant novelist uh, who, by the way, ended up in Israel after his book was published here. So I chose the books not only according to their cultural value or or poetic value, but also I made sure that they had some sort of political angle as well. Okay, so then something really interesting happens, which is uh, your translations of My Uncle Napoleon and The Colonel become both very successful for the sellers, uh, for, for the publishers. They, uh, they, I mean, there's this popular image, of course, of great animosity between Iran and Israel, well-founded for various reasons, and yet here are all these folks buying these iconic Iranian books in Hebrew. So so how, how did you react when you heard that they had actually become big sellers? It started almost as an anecdote, like, oh, there is this woman who is translating, look, uh, uh, <laughs> they actually have culture, who knew? <laughs> uh, so I think that initially that was the approach, but then it got the people's attention and provoked their sense of curiosity enough for them to actually go and buy and read the books, and then... Uh, very good reviews uh, started to appear on both books. And I was, I mean, it was a moment of great satisfaction for me. That and was, obviously I mean, this that is was a, the beginning of a journey. This isn't just Persians then buying, or people of Iranian descent in Israel buying the books. These, these are non-Iranian Jews as well, and, and non-Iranian Israelis buying these books, right? Uh, oh, definitely. I think even more non-Iranian uh, Israelis, uh, because the Iranian ones, you know, those who can read Farsi, read the books uh, in the original language. And the second and third, the Iranian generations, if they have connection uh, to the Iranian culture, it's more the pop culture and, uh, you know, uh, through music and pop culture, not so much literature, unfortunately. 
I want to ask you about the Persian community in Israel. And I was thinking, you know, is this too much in the weeds, inside baseball, as they would say, to start getting into these details? And then I think about the fact that if this program that we're doing, Rook, really wants to be about the global Iranian diaspora, we talk about the nuances of the Iranian communities in L.A. and Toronto and London. Why wouldn't we talk about the Iranian community that is in Israel? And I'm curious about the the Parsit, the Persian Jewish community there, because um like every other community, uh, as you've alluded to, there are uh, nuances and divisions, I would think, in that community as well. You come from a relatively secular family. Many Parsits are Orthodox. How do, let's say, religious and ethnic identities divide or unite the Iranian-Israeli community? I think that, uh, again, because of the basic oppression against non-Ashkenazi communities, the overall Israeli Zionist identity surpasses all others. And then underneath it, the divisions like between secular and uh, ultra-Orthodox Iranian Jews falls into the divisions in the general Israeli public. Uh, and of course it has also very clear political implications, but what unites them, I think, as an Iranian community, and I'm sorry to say that I don't feel really very much connected to that community here, is I don't even know how to, I mean, it's not the, the, uh, the thing itself, but a, a very pale shadow of that great culture, which again is mostly, almost exclusively not so sophisticated pop music, let's call it. And uh, so they celebrate no rules and they bring uh, different Iranian artists uh, to perform here. But that's about it. I mean, it's not about knowing the history, the culture, ethnicities. I taught last year a course at Ben Gurion University about society, uh, culture, and resistance in contemporary Iran. And I actually had some of my students were from uh, uh, Iranian families. It was every single word I said was completely new to them. I mean, nobody spoke with the, the second and and third and fourth Iranian uh, generation of mm. Iranian uh, families about what the Iranian identity is about in the in the greater sense, you know, that is composed of culture and history and language and so much more than just a Moin or a Shakila. Yeah. Mm. I'm glad that you mentioned that course that you teach, and and, and I, I'm thinking about the words resistance in contemporary Iran, and I wanted to ask you about that. I wanted to ask you about the fact that uh, reading your writings, hearing, uh, uh, see, seeing what you're out there doing, you are very active socially, politically. You are a human rights activist. You care deeply about the Palestinian people. You care deeply about the current situation in Israel. You can you care deeply about being an Israeli. Uh, how do you react uh, to atrocities or uh, anti-democratic events in Iran? What do you feel on a, I mean, on a personal level when protesters are killed in the streets of Tehran or a commercial plane is shot down by the government? Um, do, do you feel outraged? Do you feel helpless? Do you feel neutered or, or guilty? Or do you just feel like you have to take care of the issues in the country in which you live? I follow very, very closely uh, the situation in I in Iran, especially violations of human rights, and every time that a prisoner gets executed, every time that a woman is being murdered, every time that police shoot dead a demonstrator, I feel that a part of me is being shot. I mean, I, I, I feel 100% Iranian, and I feel 100% Israeli. And I think that, you know, the bitter irony is that I see, you know, supposedly the Israeli and the Iranian governments are like the biggest enemies and whatever. But the bitter irony is that I see so much similarities between those regimes that, you know, only speak the, the language of force and power and supremacy and, and oppression. 
so for me, it's the same struggle. And I, by the way, I, I write quite often about violations of human rights in Iran as well. I see it completely as part of my activism. Unfortunately, I cannot be more active than that. I'm not in Iran physically. I am here. I can go to demonstrations. I can, you know, do things here. But in my my feeling, I mean, it's it's completely part of the same activism, and it's it's against the same source of oppression, which is one to me in Israel or in Iran. I know you you keep in touch with relatives in Iran. Uh, I'm guessing through say WhatsApp or something. I, do you have mm-hmm. to be careful when you're communicating from Israel with folks in Iran? Oh, definitely, definitely. We take for granted that any conversation is being listened to. We are very, very careful. I am very careful not to even imply something that can put them in danger in any way. Usually when there are, you know, demonstrations or something going on, either there or here, then we would, you know, call each other to check up and see if everybody is okay. And But we never get into conversations that might imply something that, uh, you know, can put them at risk. You do you do put yourself out there early. You even you've said some things in this interview that some people are not going to like or are going to disagree with. And and I'm thinking back to what you said earlier about uh, uh, your parents being cautious about you know uh, both when they were in Iran and when they left. Uh, and this th- that that's not unique. Many Iranians are cautious about getting politically active when they migrate to a different country for all kinds of reasons. Not least feeling like they don't want to pop their heads up in a in any controversial way. After all the uh, the ways that the Iranians have. Been been portrayed. Uh, how did your family react to your journey into being as outspoken and as much of an activist as you are? Um, it has been a long uh, and sometimes really very painful journey for both sides. I mean, both for me and for my parents or my my more extended family, which have very very different polit- political views. Uh, than myself. We needed to make a choice. I remember very clearly, for example, in 2014, when um, the horrifying war in Gaza was going on, and I was writing about it, and, you know, every day counting the casualties, counting the dead. And we had one Friday uh, evening dinner, which which just exploded, and I think that that was a moment that we all thought, okay, we need to make a choice. We either want, you know, to remain a family or not. And if we choose to do so, then we should, you know, avoid those controversial uh, issues. And, and that is more or less what we've been doing uh, since. And, you know, sometimes you need to tiptoe around when when outside things are burning and we sit around you know the dinner table and we're just not speaking about it so it's there's something very awkward about it of course when things are burning outside we speak about the weather <laughs> around the dinner table hmm. but it's very fragile and uh, we make an aware attempt to to prioritize family over politics and and I think that's a wise Choice. I really appreciate the, the um, personal way in which you've you've um, uh, answered the questions in this interview and and and, and your candor. Um, before I let you go, we we talked earlier in this interview about you losing your sense of belonging, as you called it, when as a kid when you moved away from Iran to Israel at nine years old. Tell me where you're at now. You talk about your husband and your kids and finding your activism. Do you, do you have that sense of belonging now? 100%. I do, but it's a different sense of belonging. It's a sense of belonging that drives not from entitlement, but from responsibility. I mean, it took me years to realize that when I came to this country at the age of nine, even before I set foot, I already had more privileges in that country just by being Jewish than Palestinian families that had been living here for centuries, for generations. This for me is a responsibility, is an obligation to do something about it, to, you know, to use the privileges that I'm being given 
for being Jewish to actually deconstruct and then reconstruct something based on uh, equality and justice. And this is the meaning or the expression of my sense of belonging. I belong because I care about this place and I care about this place because I'm responsible for what is happening to that place because I enjoy the privileges that it offered me as a Jewish person. If I want to be a decent person, then I need to put these privileges into a better use. And that's what I'm trying to do. And that's the expression of my 100% sense of belonging here mm. now. Well, and, and I if, don't know if that made any well, sense. It, it, it was, <laughs> no, it was a really, really interesting answer. And when you are somewhere outside of Israel, you spend some time in the United States, and somebody walks up to you and says, where are you from? How do you answer? <laughs> Really? I'm curious. That's a great question. I have so many different answers <laughs> for that. I never say Israel. I say Jerusalem. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> how interesting. I'm a very proud Iranian, and I feel completely Israeli, but uh, it's a very troubled sense of uh, belonging to a place that I, unfortunately, I mean, I wish that things will develop so that one day I can feel proud about being an Israeli, but Jerusalem, though, that's my city. That I, I love Jerusalem, and I, it has that effect on people outside, you know, abroad. When you say you're yeah. from Jerusalem, there's something um, unique about that. If, if, I, if I sense that they ask me where I'm from because the way I look, then I say Iran, because th that's what they want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> you play to the crowd, uh, I see. Uh, and and uh, and and I'm guessing it's not possible for you to visit Iran right now. But would you want to at some point? Oh, it's more than want to. I'm dreaming of going back to for a visit, and I have absolutely no doubt that I will take my daughters to visit Iran one day. I hopefully they're free, independent Iran. But I, I I'm sure of it. I have no doubt that I will be back there one day. Orly Noy, uh, I thank you um, very much for the time today. Really appreciate uh, having you on this program. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Good office. Good office. That is translator, writer, activist Orly Noy. She joined us from Jerusalem today. <laughs> Taste of the live version of the Persian song Gola Sangam, in this case performed by Israeli artists Rita and Liraz Chahri. I'm saying that right. Rita, of course, being a, an Israeli star, but also uh, of Iranian background. I really, I really enjoyed uh, that conversation with Orly Noy. Yes. Really interesting. I think this is the kind of conversation, too, where we can say to uh, those of you out there listening, if you have comments about it, if you disagree, if you have thoughts about it, uh, by all means, info at rookmedia.com is where to find us to give us your thoughts, your your opinions. Uh, she certainly has hers. And, and um, what a fantastic, what an interesting story, this uh, fantastical story almost uh, of moving to a new place, a new identity, and then returning to her uh, Iranian roots in so many ways. Keon is back in our studio here, Reza and Shaya. I love that she was, um, when she was talking about cultural activism, um, uh, I've used that term to describe wh what I believe we're doing with Rook, at least the intent behind what we're doing, wanting to explore, excavate, examine, celebrate Iranian culture, and fly in the face of so much of the negative stereotypes or uh, one-dimensional portrayals of Iranians in the West in recent decades. That's part of the aim of Rook. Uh, uh, and that is cultural activism, you know, to say, hey, we're here, we're multidimensional, we're diverse, and we are globally relevant beyond the news about whatever recent atrocity or issue you're hearing about with the current government of Iran. So that intersected for me with what Orly was saying about 
how she sees her role in Israel, Captain Reza. Yeah, it was very interesting, very very interesting. I n- uh, I, I grew up in this in southern Iran and um, Shiraz. Shiraz, yeah, yeah. I was born and raised in Shiraz, and uh, Shiraz has one of the most uh, population of uh, um, Jewish people in Iran, actually, and where I live, uh, my neighborhood, we had a lot of Jewish neighbors. And it's so interesting. Uh, and I remember back then, like um, a lot of a lot of my friends, like would my would travel to Israel, and then when they would come back, they would like I'd be like, "Oh, okay, so what it's like and whatnot." Because if you have an Iranian passport, you can travel to Israel, uh, unless you're Jewish of du- Jewish descent, in which the you cannot. You cannot. Yes. Yeah. So um, that's why I was wondering how they could. You mean so what happens is that if you are uh, if you are Jewish and you want to tra- travel to Israel, the Israeli um, immigration essentially they know that they know uh-huh. that Iran bans you from entering the country, so they won't stamp your passport. So uh, my friends would travel to Turkey, and then from Turkey they would go to Israel, come back, and they'd be it'd be fine. Hmm. They they wouldn't get in trouble because there was no Israeli pass uh, stamp in their passport. This was obviously posting a lot. That's yeah. right. Yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. But um, uh, yeah, listening to Orly, it was it was very interesting. She's got very strong opinions, by the way, about the state of Israel yeah. and and, and yeah. all that. And I find it very interesting to say the least, but also in a, in a, in a way courageous. I think. Um, I don't know. Well, right. abs- well, I mean, uh, again, I mean, that's that's why when she talked about cultural activism, yeah. that is, you could say everything she's as she said that even translating Daijin Napalon into Hebrew is like a political act of sorts. Is that's you, true. you know, I mean, beyond her overt sort of political stances, just her, what she's doing is yeah. you might say courageous, I suppose. Yeah. But I mean, uh, and and not entirely out of step with what it's like for anybody who's moving to a new country and asserting, finding their cultural way and uh, pushing boundaries or pushing the envelope or trying to uh, start something new. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, a a really fascinating voice. By the way, she also has a really nice voice. I could tell it was like a radio, she'd done radio or something before. She's got a very uh, smooth, uh, really sweet voice. Yeah, Yeah. that's very, very true. Shia, that's your comment. Yes, yeah, yes. I can tell yeah, that. Yeah. I, I love her voice. Yeah, yeah. All right. Wow. You really love it, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He likes it as much as you like k looks. <laughs> That's so. <laughs> letters of the week. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was you who brought that up. I know, I know. I know. All right. I'm just kidding. It is time for Letters of the Week with Keon. Okay, so last week on episode 19, we had Nagma Samini. She's the award-winning playwright, author, screenwriter, professor, and more well-known as the co-writer of the Iranian series Shahzad, the hugely popular Iranian series. So she spoke to us about the plight of Iranian artists in the diaspora, the differences between theater in Iran and the U.S., and what it's like to be an Iranian woman behind the massive hit series. So a few people wrote to us. Uh, We have a Farzane Sadaq Qiyanlu. Sadaq Qiyanlu. Thank you, Professor Shaya. (laughs) Good input. Uh, His name is changing from Groovy Shaya to Professor (laughs) Professor (laughs) Groovy Shaya. He always teaches me so much. Kola, Kav, Tupe, what was it? Hazar. Chelsea. His Arctic is a huge tool. That is a yeah, huge yeah, tool. Very <laughs> big ball. <yeah. laughs> so she wrote wonderful interview, very informative. As well, we have a Farid Qasim Assad wrote great show. I loved it. Uh, as well, we have Simin Share on Facebook. She wrote to us. I watched all. Uh, I watched every episode of Shahzad. Good to hear from her side. There were so many. Uh, you realize how the power of that series, how. Uh, like I posted on on Facebook about now Miss Amini coming on and that she was one of the co-writers of Shahzad and I was getting all kinds of you know uh, direct messages and stuff to Shahzad no way I mean people were really really into that series uh, which 
I understand because I t- as I said a few times on that episode with Nagma, my mom is a, is a is a fanatic about that yeah. series too. But it really touched a nerve for people. Around yeah, the, around my the grandmother, world. she's obsessed with that show. Yeah, Besides Turkish uh, soap operas, yeah. That's, yes, yeah. that's yeah. <laughs> the, that's Tur- the, my mom's into Turkish soap yeah, operas too. What is it about? A that? lot of Iranians. Well, yeah, what is it? I about? Don't you know, know, because they make uh, good cereals. <laughs> <laughs> I think I imagine if the revolution never happened, Iran Iran yep. would have something similar, like She's, a kind she, of yeah. You Turkey. got a point because culturally we're we're Very rather similar, similar yeah. with a lot of the um, obviously like. Hijab is not mandatory yeah. and whatnot. Like, like a, when I went a, to a Istanbul, that's what I imagined Tehran mm-hmm. would be like if the revolution didn't happen. I've never been. Never no? been to Turkey. It's, it's no. d- d- didn't place. you grow up in Turkey? <laughs> <laughs> were you, were you no, born? No. You were born in Turkey. One right? would think. Yeah, I could just say I did. You, I mean, <laughs> seems like you do each week. You say a new place yes, where you're you were know, born. Yes, you know, my time in <laughs> Istanbul. At this point, is we don't know. I was a Turkish soap star once. What an amazing, I, I was not, what an amazing city, though, Istanbul. It is incredible. It's my, one it's of my favorites. Very the, uh, interesting. The Nexus, right? The Nexus, the meeting point. Yeah. East, West, Old, New, Europe, Asia, yeah. Muslim, Christian. Wow. It's it's just, just the melting yeah. pot of all that. It's I recommend you going there, Reza. After yeah, you what? star in Prince of Persia too. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Maybe we get we we shoot it there. Maybe. Moving on, uh, we have user Kush- Kush's Corner on Instagram wrote, I've become addicted to your podcast. Simply, yes. Yeah, yes. we got them. <laughs> uh, simply amazing. Uh, as well, we have um, another user on Instagram, uh, Mar- Markov. Mark of Excellence. Oh, wow. Mark of Excellence. Mark of Excellence. Mark of Excellence. Wow, that's brilliant. Wow. Right, right. But spelled kudos. weird. Yeah, kudos to excellence. that username. Yeah. So maybe the person so, is Mark. But perhaps. Right. Yeah. So he, he or she says, I have heard. Oh, yes. So this person says, I have heard of Kola Cap. It's not used across all of Tehran. Not sure about other cities. So uh, for those people that didn't tune in, I think it was last week, Shia. Yeah. Uh, taught us about the <laughs> <laughs> we were wondering what baseball cap is in Farsi yeah. and he said it's the Kola cap so this person is saying he that it's controversially not yes, stated controversial. it. Yeah, it started it's, a that's huge controversy it yeah it's true online. because some some don't believe that that is commonly <laughs> this know, person doesn't but, no, but, but my, my father actually uh, told me and he's in Iran right yeah, yeah. Kabul mm. lazy good that um, every hat that has some Cap and it had a brim, some, yeah, yeah. Brim, yeah. They call it cola cap uh, oh. in, um, in opposite of cola pahlavi, which is cola shapo. Oh. Oh. And then uh, in time, every hat that has some uh, what, what, what was it? What, what Br- was it? Brim again? visor. The visor. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just do a whole Brim. episode on I, the cl- Kola clearly <laughs> that. Apparently, this. I thought we had I exhausted the conversation, I, I, apparently but not, apparently man. not. There's, There's a, whole a whole history new, to it. <laughs> a new dimension. And he yeah. just mentioned something new, a new controversy. Kola Chapeau. Chapeau yeah. is a. Is I'm a huge again, fan again, of the Kola Chapeau, like the old school 1950s. Do, do, is, is Kola Chapeau a yeah, thing? Yeah, Kola Chapeau. Chapeau is French for hat. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's the so same as Kola Cap. Kola Cap and Kola Chapeau. <laughs> and Wait, but it's not the same as Kola Cap, right? No, because Col- Chapeau is not a baseball cap. No, no, Kola Chapeau is the Kola Pahlavi or Kola Ooh. Chapeau. So why isn't it just called the Kola Pahlavi? Or is it that that changed to Kola Chapo? I'm getting a headache. I, by think, the way. <laughs> I think maybe after revolution, maybe it changed to Kola Chapo. Um, no, but nope. but no, but they, they they don't allow people to say Kola Pahlavi. Yes, so. it sounds ah. it sounds like mm. it wouldn't be the thing that they would allow. Yeah. But then why would they adopt a French word after the revolution? Notwithstanding Khomeini coming from Paris at the time, I don't know. Oh, maybe that had something to do with it. Who knows? I I uh, I would really like help on this from our um, intrepid listeners. Yeah, if you want to explain, if anyone yes. can credibly explain to us what's going on with this hat situation. <laughs> so I see. I, mean, Shia I, I, I don't know if there's a Persian <laughs> Urban Dictionary that we can uh, look up, but maybe. I I'd like to know what if Kola Cap is real. If that's a real, you know. Uh, way of saying baseball cap then cola chapeau whether that's often used and cola what was the last one? Pahlavi. Pahlavi. Shai, you could write a book on this. I feel like you're so well informed. <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
moving on. <laughs> well, so, wait, what was the letter? The, oh, the letter. Oh, man, that was like 10 minutes ago. Uh, no, uh, so this person said, I have heard of Kola Cap. No. It's not used across all of Tehran. Not sure about other cities. Mm. So it's yeah. not yeah. as common as right. Shia claims. Yes. Anyway, Shire. let's not t- <laughs> discuss this Kolok app for another hour. Um, so as well, this week on episode 20, we had the feature interview with tennis master Mansour Bahrami. He's known as one of the greatest entertainments in the sport with his outstanding trick shots and huge personality. He spoke to us about his unbelievable story of suddenly losing all of his future tennis dreams after the 1979 Iranian Revolution and his incredible story of how he moved to France and the sheer dedication just just to spend his life doing what he loves, playing tennis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I One of my favorite episodes, I have to say, and I think most people will He agree. landed in France with Kola Chapeau in his hand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, nothing, love his, nothing I love but that, that story, that story of how he, you know, his first night there, um, losing uh, every, all his money at the casino, money. topless yeah. women at the beach. Yeah. Well, what he, he had, he went and gambled yeah. the first night. That was just <laughs> such a, that could be a movie. Movie, that entire night was his just whole life is the the, uh, the big takeaway for me was um, and I think we I, I, well I guess it was the last episode but we haven't mm-hmm. had a chance to talk about it, is this guy uh, his positivity about life about where he's at in life his it's this that's the inspirational part for sure. he grew up with nothing he played tennis with a frying pan and wood mm. you know and then he then he becomes a you know he, he finds out that he's really talented because he is and gets the chance to potentially become a global star and his career is shut down for 10 years because of the the revolution and tennis being banned and all that he cannot emerge into big into stardom after that because he's past his prime um but he's still entertaining people he's still such a such a warm personality like there yeah. was no bitterness to detect in all not that. Not at all. Think about the people who are bitter because they, you know, the coffee's not hot enough or something yeah. or, or, or you know, stuff that's Just going on in the world right now, mm-hmm. which is tough, but... Mm-hmm. It's nothing compared to, to what this guy's been sure. through. He's just such a positive force. Yeah. And he and he did it for the love of the sport. That's the thing. He would never pursued it for money or any other reason. Just he loved tennis that much. And even when I said at the end, you know, are you, do you make a lot of money or you care? He, he doesn't care about it. He mm-hmm. says, I, I, I grew up with nothing, so I don't, oh. I don't need anything, it, which is really empowering. It touched me for yeah. sure. It was a touching interview. A lot of people wrote in uh, after that episode. So we have a Solat. To see uh, on Facebook wrote, I love this guy as well. Nishat, a last name HT on Facebook wrote, I adore him. Thank you for this interview. Uh, and we have Sasan Imam on Facebook wrote, This guy is a legend. And then we have Davoud Mont- Manter wrote, uh, on Facebook wrote, He is one of the icons in my life. Always I was thinking about the pressure he carried after the revolution and his unique way to come back to the summit in his very unique way. Thanks to the Rook team and especially to you, Jian John. Beautiful. Nice. Thank you. Truly. Uh, Truly. Yeah. Uh, Tim Robinson as well wrote, could hit any shot. What a personality. <laughs> and then we have a Arash Zul- Zulgadri on Facebook wrote, great interview with a great legend. As a big tennis fan, I have read about Mansu Bahrami and have listened to many of his past interviews. But I didn't know much about his childhood, his journey to France, and the many challenges he had faced. So well done, as always. And then we have Do you Sean. remember when you said last week, like some... Somebody, we were mentioning one of the letters, and you said, I know that person. Right. right? You know this and then person. it turns out you knew them in Halifax when yeah, you were yeah. kids. I know this person. Oh, you do? It's my cousin. Oh. <laughs> oh that <laughs> makes sense. That's that's sense. sense. Yeah, he, he, and he's really into tennis. I can so tell. So I was really excited about him, uh, and he plays, and I was yeah. really excited about him uh, having, like, Mansur Bahrami Bar- Bar- yeah, coming yeah. on. It's nice that he wrote. He wrote Actually, that. it's funny because I remember when you were talking to Shaya about yes. tennis, you were like, Shaya asked you if you, you ever mentioned. play tennis. You sort of, you said, you were like, uh, I, I, my cousins do, really. I'm not good at it. Uh, is it, is it the same? That's, cousin? he's one of the cousins oh, who plays oh, tennis, yeah. Wow, but, wonderful. but, uh, uh, there's a few cousins who play tennis, yeah. but he's definitely, but, uh, but I, I, and I wish I played. I mean, I, th- I think it's a, it's a very cool sport. It, it I mean, sport. I, but it, it looks so, at the top levels, it looks so, mm-hmm. And I've gone to a lot of tennis matches and stuff, but I, I but I, yeah, no, I'm no good. You're at no it. good. Uh, I'm no <laughs> good. But uh, but thank you, Arash, for that yeah, that letter. 
Uh, we have Sean Long on YouTube wrote another great interview. And uh, yeah. So last but not least, we have the letter of the week. So on Rook episode 20, as I mentioned, we had Mansour Bahrami, the tennis legend. Um, so we have someone by the name of Daver Bonab, who has the letter of the week. On YouTube, he wrote us, Thank you so much, Gian and crew, for this week's wonderful guest and well overdue recognition of such a great man of our world community of Iranians and French Iranians for that matter. And this is to you, Mansour. And to be quite Rook, I hope he gets to read this. He writes, Mansour, I am old enough to remember watching Cup Arya Mehr without being a member of the elite in Tehran that you mentioned. I remember how I was mesmerized by this sport from early on. Having played tennis for the last 38 years of my life, regardless of whatever life threw at me, I played it with my heart and then my body. This should be a small indication of how important this sport is to me and how deeply in love I am with this game. And you, Mansoor, yes, you and your life story have been the light and the force driving my passion and the hard work I put into this game of tennis. I am also a kid from Amjadia Tennis Courts, believe it or not. Your name and game still lives in there more vividly than ever before. You are a true legend and you keep inspiring a lot of people, young and old, with your talent, humility and perseverance. We all love to watch you play anywhere in the world, and my sister, Paranoz, is especially a huge fan who cheers for you every single time you are on the court in the Aussie Open. We love you, man. That was a very touching letter. It's very well deserved. Very worthy of letter of the week. That yeah. is Daver. Daver Bonab wrote that. Daver Bonab. Thank yeah. you so much for that. That's that's amazing. And I guess we'll try and figure out a way to get that to. I mean, we've got his number. We, mm -hmm. We'll get it to Mansoor. We'll send that to yeah. him. Yeah. That, that's a yeah. really. He might really appreciate getting I think that. I'm sure he, he gets a lot of fan mail, but <laughs> why not? Thank you, Kian June. Thank, Thank you, Kian. Kian. Thank you, Captain Reza. Thank you, Groovy Shia. Uh, thanks to all the uh, amazing people who put this show together and uh, help us do this uh, to to Reza, Shia, Ponta, Susan, Muhammad, Mehrdad, Keon, uh, the whole team, all of those people out there who are supporting us and, and spreading the word on this. Um, please continue to do so. It means a lot to us. If you go to any of our platforms, wherever you're listening to us right now, you can subscribe on that platform. And we're going to go out on... Another version of Gola Sangam, also by an Israeli artist. Yes. Tell us who this is. Uh, she is uh, Noa Exino, uh, if I right pronounce her name. And it was for uh, a month ago, and yeah, she sang Gola Sangam. It's a beautiful version. Yeah. Thanks for this, Shia. Thanks to everybody. Mizun Bashin. Jump down.